I, I was born in 1890 on the farm in Osnabrook Township. A lot of, most of our neighbors had sawdusts, but we had lumber. My father was a pretty good carpenter and he built his own house. My first camera, a regular, was a 507. I got it in 1909. I got it from, uh, from Sears Roebuck. It was made in Rochester, Minnesota. It's a 507 camera, focusing camera, long focus, and I still have it up in the attic. Well, I used to use the 5 or 7 camera for a great many years. And uh, with the 5 or 7, I took pictures of, of big barns and cattle and uh, the thrashing machines. My uncle, That's Joseph Hansen, had a thrashing machine. And, uh, and I remember going over there and taking pictures of, the, of his thrashing machine. I clicked, you know, just with 5 or 7. And I took a lot of pictures of that thing. The schoolhouse was, was, was on our farm, and I only had to walk uh, maybe a quarter of a mile to school. And when I graduated from, from the eighth grade there, so I went, went to high school one year, the first year in Blooming Prairie, Minnesota. And then, then the next year, I went to Ellendale, North Dakota, to the normal industrial school, they call it. When I was going to school, I was a I was the the uh, school's photographer, and then any time they the school wanted some pictures taken, they'd call on me and I'd take the pictures. came along, first, first World War, I, I was going to the University of California. I'd, uh, I'd taken three years. They wouldn't let me stay and, and finish, so they sent me over to a place near Paris. Mont Valerian was called the place where he had the military camp. And then they sent me up to the front to, uh, to plot the course of the German bombers. And we had listening devices, had big parabolic reflectors. We listened all the time. He spotted an airplane, we could tell the plane by the sound, and the plane would come along and it would go in different directions. But I would plot the course on this, on this big sheet of paper, plot the course of the airplane, and every 10 seconds I'd make a mark, and I'd know where he's going to be. In the next 10 seconds I'd give him the reading, and the way they'd go, they'd shoot the light on him, get him in the light. When they got him in the light, French fighters just come from all, all directions, and, and they'd shoot these German plane, they come down in a ball of fire. They come down, boom, by wire. Then I went back to the laboratory in Paris, which was the Signal Corps laboratory, and I was on working, working on inventions that we could use at the front. For instance, uh, so they made something so, that, so they could shoot from the fighter planes right through, through, the, through the front and uh, not hit the propeller. Oh, when, the, when the war was over, I had been University of California every three years, and, I'm, and they let me take the, the course at the University of Paris, Paris University. And uh, I had some very interesting instructors there. The, the woman that, that taught chemistry was Madame Curie. I can speak a little French, not, not very much, yeah. uh, but I, I took the course in French in, at the university at the same time learned to speak some French. And one of my instructors was the man who built the Eiffel Tower. And his name in French was Monsieur Eiffel. And he had a laboratory, and he had model airplanes with currents of air flowing. And he'd make models of for experiment. And I went there, I heard his lectures and stuff like that. And one time, I asked him if I could take his picture. He says, sure. He says, oui, oui. So he came out, and he came out, and I took his picture, and I got a very good picture of him. When I, when I got through it with the school, I had a banjo that I made of a German shell. And there were enough people that, in our outfit that could play instruments. We got a, a five-piece orchestra. And we went around and played in, in nightclubs all in Paris, all around in Paris. <laughs> played in 
nightclubs and places where they where they would restaurants, you know, they'd have an orchestra. There were people in the restaurant who were Americans and they wanted to hear American pieces. And they'd come up and they'd give us the money, five, ten, fifteen, and twenty dollars to play their pieces. So I, I made I made something like five hundred dollars in the the rest of that year playing for, for dances. And then, then then I came back to North Dakota and the, uh, folks were very glad to see me. So I, I stayed home and visited around. So the so the 15th of August, I took the train and went to Berkeley and finished up my my senior year, got my degree. Well, then, then a man came from New York City from the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. And I told him my experiences and stuff like that. And he says, I'd like to have you in the, in the, in the research department of the American Tell and Tell. So I moved, moved all my stuff to New York and, and I got a a job at 195 Broadway. And I was there for about five years. And during that time, I worked on several inventions. Oh, I got about five patents for the American Tell and Tell on the signaling, long distance signaling, my wire, my wire. And uh, then uh, one of the men, Mr. David Grimes, was uh, was interested in in, uh, in radio, and he he was chief engineer of a radio, Grimes Radio Incorporated, and he asked me to come with him, so they gave me about twice as much salary as I could in American Tell. So I went to then. I've been in radio then for a long time, and finally, uh, <clears throat> their their outfit would become bank bankrupt. I don't know why, but uh, I got a job at at uh, Victor Talking Machine Company in Camden, oh. New Jersey. And I was working, because Victor was just going into radio then. And I had had some radio experience. And uh, I was there for, for, for about three years. It was RCA Victor. It was, it was, it was uh, after a couple of years, David Grimes said that I could get a job with the, uh, the Hackett Sylvania Company in, in, in Pennsylvania. Emporium. So I worked for, in, for, in an Emporium for about three years on, uh, on radios. I was working on machines and devices for testing radio sets. That's what I, and I got several patents there too. And then Grimes <coughs> called me and says, how'd you like to work for Philco Corporation? So I went to Philco then. Well, I guess it was 1935 about. And I worked for Philco for 23 years. And I worked on in their research laboratory, and I got quite a few patents. I got 23 patents altogether on new devices. And most of them went into production. One was a, a phonograph that used to be the light, photoelectric phonograph. It went very good for about two years. I worked on different different kinds of things. Why is when the first when the Second World War came about? I was I was too old to go to war, so I worked on army stuff. After when I left Chilco, I retired. Fifty nine. Fifty nine. I retired. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I got about two thousand dollars for each and for each uh, patent that they used. So I uh, I came out all right that way. Mysterious control box for the radio over there. There's a new gadget just out, see? You dial your station here, and you hear it over there. Well, where are the wires? They're in the wires. That's the trick. See? Now, if you want it loud, you dial loud, and that makes it loud. Now, if you want it soft, you dial soft. Now, it's soft. Anyhow, that telephone don't work. That's just for the trunks. If you want a phone, there's one over there. When the blue of the night meets the gold of the day, someone 
waits for me. Thing. Thank uh, you, Ken. By the way, do you want to know what makes my heart go crazy? I'm not too eager, Ken, but I'll bet it begins with Philco. <laughs> oh, you're so right, Bing. It's a Philco 1201. Ken, you know Bob Hope is here tonight. Well, yeah, and, I know. Uh, and Dorothy Lamour. So tonight, let brevity be your keynote. Huh? The folks are waiting to hear from Lamour. Well, Dottie is beautiful and charming, but personally, my heart still goes crazy for the 1201. That's the streamlined automatic way to play records. Mm -hmm. Is it as attractive in a sarong as Lamour? <laughs> well, no, but the 1201 is the easiest radio phonograph in the world to spin your records on. Doesn't spin any easier than Hope. He's really in a whirl, that boy. <laughs> Perpetual whirl. And while we're looking back along the road, let me remind you that Philco pioneered the modern portable radio that plays on its own batteries. Along with such other Philco firsts as the original of all table model radios, the famous Philco Baby Grand the first practical automobile radio, the modernized radio phonograph with no needles to change. These and many other electronic achievements have made Philco today the world's largest radio manufacturer because the greatest achievements in radio tone, performance, and value have come from the Philco laboratories first. Always thinking ahead, Philco gives you tomorrow in your radio set today. Incidentally, I must get home now, brush my teeth with pepsidant. Yeah, and I must get home and sleep in my Philco console. <laughs> See you at Paramount tomorrow morning, Robert. Shooting a picture you are, we know. Yeah, we're finished with favorite brunette, you yes. know. But try to be on time, will you, yes. for Road to Rio? See you at the crack of dawn. <laughs> Bring a lime cola, will you? <laughs> Good night, folks. This program is produced and transcribed in Hollywood by Bill Morrow and Murdo McKenzie. Tune in to Philco Radio Time next week when Peggy Lee returns and Bing's guest will be Beatrice Lilly. <laughs>